as we get into 2023, there's a lot of uncertainty of 2022 that we seem to be carrying forward into the new year. The Russia-Ukraine conflict is still on. The rising China COVID cases is impacting the global commodity demand. The aggressive rate hikes from central banks and the US dollar moves have all impacted the asset classes. But what are the signs that you need to watch as you make your portfolio allocations in the new year is what we will discuss with our top names in the industry today. Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions and we will discuss about commodities on how you need to trade them in 2023. I'm Anisha Gupta and joining me on the show is Ole Hansen. He's head of commodity strategy at Saxo Bank. Oh, hi. Always a pleasure to have you on CNBC TV 18 India. I want to start with what we really have seen in 2022 in sense of commodities, where we saw all-time highs, multi-year highs, and then the prices declining 40 to 50 percent from those kind of levels, and then the 8 to 8, 10 percent of a gain from those lows as well. It has been a volatile year. Is that one of the things that we are carrying forward into 2023? Good afternoon, Manisha. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have multiple uh, uncertainties as we uh, start 23, and uh, that will uh, drive some uh, continued volatility. But uh, 22 has most certainly been a year where commodities has made a, you can call it a comeback in, in terms of the, how it's being perceived by consumers and, and, and people around the world, because uh, it's suddenly become a year where we've been become uh, a accustomed to the fact that we have tight supplies in, in several key commodities <clears throat> and that uh, creates this uh, this uh, volatility spikes that, that, that we're seeing. So um, more of that to come in the start of the new year and, uh, and obviously in, this, in the short term, as you mentioned, the focus will still be on the war in Ukraine, uh, but uh, probably more importantly, uh, what's uh, the, the, the short term developments in, in China? Hmm. All, uh, you know, sometime in 2020 and 21, there was a conversation about a bull cycle, perhaps, in commodities. How do you see as we end this year? I think the bull cycle is still uh, very much uh, in play. Uh, we have uh, seen a correction during the past uh, few months here, and I think primarily the, the, the correction has been driven by, by the... the um, by the developments in China, where we simply have uh, the, the, the recovery from the COVID uh, lockdowns has been uh, delayed by by many months, and now we are still looking uh, probably for another two, one to three months delay as well. Uh, the dollar was um, the, the the dollar was a, a major development as well this year, and and, and probably most importantly the, the the rapid rise in interest rates that we've seen across the world, uh, also having a, to a, in the latter part a, a somewhat negative impact uh, given the prospect for it uh, driving some economies into a potentially into a recession next year. But I think the the supply outlook, and that's why the that's where we could see an interesting year next year. That the supply outlook remains tight for many commodities, and that basically means if even if we should have an economic slowdown, then the supply situation will will equally also be important, and that could see that uh, that could drive some of these key commodities uh, to higher levels. And what are these key commodities that you see? Is it food, or do you think the industrial commodities could see some support as well? I certainly don't hope that it's going to be the food uh, side of the equation. Uh, that obviously depends very much on the weather. We we do know that we're entering 23 with the, with the lower stock levels than we entered 22. That obviously leaves us more exposed uh, with regards to uh, any any adverse weather developments uh, next year. But I think the uh, where our, our main focus is uh, is probably primarily on the metal space, both industrial and precious metals. We are seeing a we are seeing a recovery eventually in China. There's no doubt they need to get the the growth back on track, and the, that will be commodity intensive, but more selective than we've seen in the past. They're not just going to go out uh, and build new uh, new cities that no one wants to live in. So the, it's potentially not steel and concrete that we're going to look at. It's more the more the uh, the industrial metals we're used towards the infrastructure and and the the energy transition that uh, that will will be in 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 play. And on the precious metals, uh, we've had a phenomenal year, I would say, in, in gold and silver. Gold especially, it's unchanged in the year in dollar. Uh, in the year where we've seen a rapid rise in the dollar, we've seen the biggest jump in bond yields in, in decades. And despite of these developments, gold is, uh, is almost finished in the year, close to unchanged, perhaps even with a small plus. And what, what happens in next year when we start to see the dollar um, reverse some of its strengths, we see eventually that the interest rate stops rising. Uh, and and more importantly, that inflation does not come down to the level that the market is currently pricing in. These are basically our, our reasons for, for maintaining a bullish outlook for, for gold and with that also silver next year. Mm. 
Uh, we'll have to have to talk to you about the Saxo Bank report about $3,000 per ounce in case of gold. How have you read, seen that report? What's your own sense? Well, it's part of our annual uh, exercise of trying to come up with 10 outrageous predictions. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the developments that we we don't see happen, but at the same time, if they do happen, it obviously has a major impact on on, on markets and, and the way we, we look at markets. And the uh, the $3,000 call for gold is not because we're actually seeing gold down. We are, we are bullish on gold next year, but obviously for $3,000 to be reached, uh, a lot of things has to be aligned at the same time. But it is building on the on the assumption that central banks will eventually uh, lose control with their, their inflation fighting uh, abilities simply because the economic uh, outlook uh, slows to the extent that they they'll have to reverse some of their some of their focus there and just assume some of the inflation that's coming into the system is structural it's like getting a genie out of the bottle once it's out of the bottle it's very difficult to to put it back in again and that basically means that inflation will not come down to two and a half percent anytime soon and once we when we get start to get that realignment we could also see a realignment in, in prices for some of the some of the metals especially uh, especially gold so um, so yeah it's an outrageous call some have said well it's not that outrageous but uh, i think just looking at the price it has to travel for to reach that level it is quite a quite a significant uh, jump which we don't has our have our as our base case but uh, but still i wouldn't be surprised if we tend to could see a rec record high next year Hmm. Uh, oh, let me push you for some of these uh, uh, price outlooks as well. So, uh, outrageous, yes, uh, that done with. What's your sense on what are we looking at as in sense of range for gold and silver for the new year? Well, we're trading just above 1800 this morning. Uh, it's, it's doing quite well, uh, considering the, uh, the, the news from Bank of Japan overnight, which has sent the bond yields high and the dollar uh, lower. Uh, so it does indicate uh, that right now that the main focus in the market is the dollar. So that obviously will be the key key driver next year. But uh, I see gold uh, move, uh, as I said, up to back towards uh, back towards 2000 in, in the near term with uh, silver potentially getting some additional uh, tailwind from industrial metals, uh, keeping a close eye on copper in that regard. Uh, copper potentially could even could even do better than that. So uh, so that could potentially take it up towards the 30 level. OK, and uh, since you are looking at copper as another uh, gainer in the next year, what's your sense on prices there? Well, the the market has been lukewarm on copper in twenty three, just simply from the fact that we know there will be additional mining supply come on uh, on stream uh, next year. Some of those uh, some of those has has actually already started to be be lowered uh, or projection started to be lowered. And then right now we we're looking at a situation in Panama where the government has uh, has uh, is forcing uh, the, the big uh, the, the mining company in, in charge to either pay higher taxes or or or, or leave the leave the site. That is basically one point one and a half percent of global mine supply. That is supply mm. we we most certainly don't uh, can't live without next year. So, with the transformation, uh, looking at what's happening in, in Europe and in Asia, with the transformation is gathering pace, and it will require uh, a lot of copper. So, uh, so we remain uh, we remain positive on the outlook for copper, and and could see a, a record high not in twenty four, but perhaps already next year. All right, a record high in case of copper prices as well. And what's your sense on energy? Because we've seen this week also come out in sense of European Union agreeing for a gas price uh, cap as well in the month of Feb. How will all this pan out and any price views that you would have for energy? Well, gas price in Europe is, uh, has returned to the 100 euro uh, market. We were just briefly above 130 uh, as the cold spell set in. I'm wearing a jumper because it is cold in, in Scandinavia. We're keeping the temperatures low in order to preserve energy. Um, but the, the, so far, the, uh, the the crisis, the gas crisis winter is over. Uh, we're not going to have a crisis. The inventory levels are so high that we have more than a month worth of, of peak demand uh, just in stores relative to what we had at this time last year. But the, 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 the worries are obviously still for, for the coming winter, the next winter. Uh, but I think as, as well, we if we do get a, situ uh, a solution uh, to the situation in Ukraine, which obviously a, is a very big if at this point in time, if we do get a solution, we will also see increased flows of gas uh, coming back to Europe, not at the, the, the degree that we saw in the past, but obviously they will probably send more gas. So I'm, I'm positively, I'm quietly confident that we will we will see the situation continue to, to stabilize. If you look at the energy markets for fossil fuels in general, Crude oil prices uh, probably has found a bottom, I think, at this point. 
SPR uh, uh, refilling in the U.S., OPEC Plus, uh, keeping a close eye on prices and potentially stand ready to uh, to cut production if needed. I think it has created a soft floor under the market. Are we going to see a, a return to above 100? I doubt that in, in the short to medium term. Um, um, once we get through the, the, the lockdowns or the virus outbreaks in China, I think we could see a return to the 90 to 100 dollar area. And that's probably where I'll see, I'd like to see it most, trade most of the time uh, next year. But obviously, again, forecasting oil prices is, is extremely difficult, just looking at what, uh, what kind of moves we had so far this year. Well, I understand that is going to be, uh, as we've seen in 2022, uh, you know, the price bets came in earlier than expected and or didn't come at all. And that kind of uncertainty is what we are getting into 2023 as well. But thank you so much all for joining us and giving us a sense on all of those commodities and what to expect in the new year 2023. On that note, let's take a short break. We will be joined by Edward Morse, Managing Director and Head of Commodities Research at City, with his view as well on 2023 outlook on commodities. Welcome back. Uh, we're watching Commodity Champions. I'm Anisha Gupta. And what will 2023 look like for the commodity space? What are the key events to look at while planning your portfolio? To answer all of these questions, I am now joined by Edward Morse, Managing Director and Head of Commodities Research at City. Ed, hi. It's such a pleasure to have you. I want to start uh, uh, asking you about the price view that you would have on the energy space. So whether it's about crude oil or natural gas, what's your sense on these? Well, we think that they're going to remain volatile, um, maybe not quite as volatile as last year, but still volatile on a short term basis. And that uh, is a result of several factors. Uh, the first one, I would say, is a significant lack of liquidity in uh, futures and options markets, which means that uh, we see sell offs, we see buying that's very erratic and we can have one or two firms enter the market in a big way and if they have a big position for themselves and there's not a lot, enough liquidity to absorb whether they're selling or whether they're buying. Uh, and we then see prices going down by $5 or more or up $5 or more. We don't see that changing anytime soon. The second factor involved in uh, the volatility is of course, the really significant lack of inventories in the world. So that when we have seasonal changes, uh, and we have uh, changes uh, that are impacted, especially by weather. We have a greater uh, volatility because of a lack of cushions that are in the market. Uh, and uh, a third factor is the weather itself. Uh, and that's because uh, ever since the late 1990s, uh, excuse me, ever since the late 2019, 2020 period, uh, we've seen the global gas market become a global market. It used to be a fragmented market. It was fragmented in part because uh, underlying gas is an inability or an expense of transporting it from one place to another. Even more restrictive were destination restrictions that were imposed in most of the first three decades of LNG. Uh, and that's because these projects are so expensive in terms of both liquefaction capital required and regasification capital required. And then enter the United States, uh, which by the end of the last decade became the largest LNG exporting country in the world. And the US has rules against destination restrictions, which has allowed, uh, which has allowed uh, natural gas to move from one place to another on a spot basis uh, whenever there is a shortage one place or another. So uh, we will have undoubtedly weather affecting the natural gas markets far more than affecting other markets. And they'll be rippling around the world. If we have a, uh, a polar vortex in Europe, for example, we can see current prices, which are uh, in terms of dollars per million BTUs, around six or five in the United States uh, and, and around uh, 23 or so in uh, 25 in Europe and uh, a little over 30 in the Asian markets at the moment. The European market is getting tighter with colder weather. If we have a polar vortex, we could see on a BTU basis, uh, gas going up to $60 per million BTUs or even higher, 10 times 
where they were at the beginning of 2021, three times or so higher than now. Um, and uh, we think there'll be much more volatility in the gas markets. Well, clearly, uh, crude and gas both continue to be quite volatile, but we understand those ranges that you've told us. I also want to talk to you about the gold prices, which in the last quarter of the year have seen a bit of a rebound. Would you advise allocating funds for this in the new year? And what's your sense on prices? We actually think that um, when we get to an easing of central bank tightening, then gold will see its day. Uh, and uh, the increase we saw when gold reverted back up above uh, $1,800 an ounce uh, not so long ago, that coincided with a fall in the value of the U.S. dollar, DXY, went from about uh, 110 to an index of around 102. Uh, and then uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, despite the skeptics who said they were going to slow down rate increases, did not do that. Uh, and we don't think they're going to slow down until they get to a higher level. So we think gold will be bouncy until uh, until the central bank, and particularly the U.S. central bank, slows down and stops its rate increases, at which point we think gold will be on a rebound, and we think that uh, gold will likely exceed the $1,900 an ounce level by the end of the year uh, and higher than that in uh, 2024. Okay. So gold prices can stay around $1,800 per ounce. But what about silver? Because this has seen a big range as well. Do you see industrial demand support prices in the new year? Well, silver is kind of funny. It's neither a pure industrial metal nor a pure a precious metal substitute for gold. So it responds both to the way gold is responding and it responds to uh, industrial production. We don't see any massive increase in industrial production uh, in uh, Europe, uh, we see a continued slowdown of it in the U.S., uh, the two stars of the world in terms of growth of industrial demand in the year might be in Asia, might be China and India. But uh, in, in China, the rebound is not going to be in the first quarter. Uh, there are too many uh, headwinds, including the continued uh, evidence of uh, COVID itself ramping up, even as the lockdowns are easing. So uh, to the degree there would be an industrial rebound, it's likely to be the latter part of the year rather than before then, um, and uh, more likely to be, as I said, uh, in East and South Asia than in either Europe or North America. All right, at least there is some hope in the second half of next year. Also, steel and iron ore prices have seen support on China stimulus uh, injections. Your sense on all of these commodities in 2023? Well, a sense on commodities in 2023 is going to be very divergent from one another. Uh, we think that, um, unlike some others, that we're not entering a commodity super cycle. We think, unlike others, uh, the evidence is overwhelming that uh, the cost structure of the industry uh, for oil and gas is such that uh, even at these prices, there's an encouragement of a new investment. We think the new investment is adequate. Uh, you mentioned iron ore, where we've raised our prices recently. Uh, that has to do in particular with the status of inventories around the world. Uh, China is starting to ramp up a little bit on its industrial production. Uh, so we've raised our, uh, our price outlook for, for iron ore uh, getting above $140 a ton uh, in the interim, maybe going even higher. Uh, but given the cost of extracting iron ore, uh, we expect that by the end of the year, iron ore prices will level off and get down back down to the $100 range. When we look at industrial metals, we are actually sh on the short side for the short term and on the long side for the long term. Uh, we've seen adequate inventories uh, in China uh, with their own slowdown. We've seen uh, a lack of demand in the short run. We've seen financial flows into the market that have recently raised the price of not of all, but most metals. Uh, we think they raised the price to a level that's not coincident. Uh, not not at not really realistic in terms of the supply demand balances today. Uh, on the other hand, while we expect prices to come down from their highs uh, in the first quarter, we do think that by the end of the year, we think most industrial metals, with perhaps the exception of aluminum, will be on the rebound. Uh, and indeed, we are very positive 
on most industrial metals, particularly the metals that have an important role to play in battery power. Uh, uh, and that includes copper uh, and aluminum eventually for purposes of wiring uh, in a world in which uh, electric vehicles and electrification in general and the distribution of electricity are becoming more important. But we have nickel and we have cobalt and manganese uh, and other battery metals, including lithium. Uh, uh, lithium may be the one uh, exception where uh, the demand is hitting the marginal price at the part at the end of the supply curve and the prices will go up. Uh, and we've really seen an inadequate amount uh, of investment on the on the metal side. I say the big exception is lithium where prices have gone up uh, a significant amount over the last year. Uh, but uh, the cost of extracting lithium is a tiny fraction of the price in the marketplace, maybe one tenth of it at the moment on average. Uh, and that suggests that as more lithium is brought into the market, the price will have much more downward pressure uh, unique among uh, the battery metals. Fair point. But uh, Ed, among the base material prices, the best bullish bet clearly continues to come in case of copper. What kind of demand supply scenario do you envision here? Uh, well, we, we um, envisage a uh, supply and demand scenario where the price of copper at the margin will grow above 9,000 and hit 10,000. Uh, dollars a ton before long. So it's really looking at uh, where we think demand is coming from and what a supply curve is telling us. All right. That's a lot of non-agro commodities, but I do want to talk about the soft commodities. And this was an year of highs and immense profits. What's your uh, best bet or what catches your eye for 2023 within softs? Well, it depends on what we're looking at. What catches our eye um, initially uh, is that uh, when we when we look at the grains complex that um, the world was caught in a tight market when the Russia-Ukraine conflict started, uh, and then there were concerns about uh, everything from fertilizer and where it's going to come from uh, to what if there is a disruption uh, of uh, grain exports, corn and wheat from Ukraine, uh, and that falling into a shortage in uh, in Russia, and what the impacts for that are going to be uh, on emerging market countries dependent upon uh, those uh, Russian and Ukrainian exports. Uh, and then we had bad weather in Brazil, bad weather in the United States. But as you know, uh, and we had one other thing, we had countries, including India, that put a ban on the exports of softs in particular in order to preserve a lower price in a domestic market. But a lot of that is easing, uh, particularly on the grain side, a little bit more complicated when it comes to the other softs, when it comes to sugar and uh, coffee and cocoa and the like. Uh, but still we see as a result of higher prices, more acreage uh, under cultivation seasonally in both uh, Latin America uh, and uh, Australia and, and other parts of the Southern hemisphere. Uh, and then uh, followed by more acreage under cultivation uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Undoubtedly, we don't know the level of drought in the, in the future. Brazil has come out of its drought, a mid continent in the US has come out of its drought, and Europe has come out of its drought. So uh, the weather looks more favorable, uh, and we think the prospects are, uh, for most softs, neutral to bearish. All right, that's good news, at least from the food inflation part of it, that most soft commodities could be looking at neutral to bearish cues coming in for 2023. Ed Morse, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us with your sense on all of those commodities. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Commodity Champions. Thank you for watching.